All right, so we're talking about careers in finance, and I'm talking to Frank Schwab. So, Frank, maybe you could just introduce yourself and what you're doing. So, um, right now, I'm doing several things at the same time. I'm, let's say, a member of the board of uh, Gulf International Bank in Bahrain, um, where I help to oversee all innovation activities of the bank. The, in the age of digitalization. I'm also part of the risk advisory committee at PayU. PayU is a, um, a large payment service provider who operates globally in more than 40 countries. Um, seven years ago, I have founded, uh, co-founded uh, the German FinTech Forum, where by now we have seen more than 300 German speaking FinTechs and more than 100 German fintech investors. So basically, we uh, help the German fintech ecosystem, let's say, to expose themselves. Also, we do that, uh, let's say, with a platform in English, so not in German. Uh, that differentiates us from all the other activities. And from time to time, I also publish on LinkedIn and other social media channels, plus I'm a public speaker, always on the topic and where the intersection of banking, innovation, and technology is. And, and maybe you could explain your kind of daily schedule or how you handle what seems to be so many activities. Yeah. So actually, um, since um, I don't have a day-to-day -day job anymore, um, it's not so time consuming as you think. So mm. basically with the supervisory jobs, um, it's basically once a month where I spend uh, a couple of days, but, but basically that's it for these kind of jobs. And mm. uh, the FinTech Forum basically is an ongoing thing like your podcast show. Yep. Uh, where it depends uh, um, how much effort I want to put in. It may once a week or once a day, uh, but the event is once a year. Right. So we have a one, once a year event and a platform where we publish on a regular basis uh, news and articles about the German fintech ecosystem. Mm. And then the public speaking is also basically a great thing because usually people pay you for 20 minutes um, doing your presentation or doing a keynote. Um, of course, this needs to be prepared, um, but let's say if you are 30 years in business and you have something to say, uh, you, you prepare it once and mm. you basically you own your three to five topics where you, you're really good at. And then the, the presentation is just the delivery of your experience. And, and if you have done it many times, and I guess over the last 15 years, I had more than 300 uh, uh, speeches, uh, then, then it's actually um, not time consuming anymore. Mm. It's uh, more about um, the quality when you performing. Right. Exactly. Interesting. I have a, keynote speech coming up in February at a, a conference of academics in relation to engineering and technology, which I'm not an engineer and I'm not a technologist, but what I think about, you know, and I, I've been talking about what can really impact the audience, but I think my, my biggest thing is like thinking about technology in terms of management and how um, technology can't really replace face-to-face -face interactions between people. And, and also, I think one of the things that we often miss is the scientific method in management. A lot of times, you know, what we don't realize is that we're, you know, we're, we're coming up with hypothesis that I think the earnings are going to grow faster if we do this. And in the scientific method, we can apply, test that hypothesis, and then review the outcome of that. And sometimes we're running so fast, we forget that really we are applying principles of science, you know, underneath what we're trying to do in our business. So maybe we can go back to kind of when you, uh, when you were younger. I think we may have some things in common. I mean, like I think about uh, the school that I went to and, you know, I was, when I was young, 
I didn't have, personally for me, I didn't have the money to even go to a full college. I needed to go to a community college until I could get the grades and get the money to go to a, a state you know, university. I went to Cal State Long Beach in California, but maybe you could just tell us a little bit about your, your beginnings in your career in finance. Yeah. So actually, my career started more than 30 years ago, uh, where I started uh, with an apprenticeship at Deutsche Bank. So by profession, I'm a real banker. Um, and um, I got uh, lucky because Deutsche Bank was ready to pay my studies uh, at Mannheim University. So I studied computer and business science at that time, also with focus of banking and finance. Uh, at the same time, I work at the local trading department in Mannheim. Um, so um, at that time, I also was exposed first time 1993 to the internet. And I, uh, that, that's something I, even at that time, I thought that way will, will make a big impact. So I was very interested in, uh, let's say, having a job also within Deutsche Bank, dealing with the internet. And uh, it happened a couple of years later that I became one of the first, let's say, business heads, uh, then called Internet and New Media. Um, uh, that was back in 1998 to 2003, where I had these, let's say, this huge growth phases where we onboarded more than 100,000 clients a month uh, on the internet. So, so that, and, and that for a couple of years. So this was, was a really exciting time. Uh, at the end, I was actually um, really tired and Deutsche Bank again uh, helped me uh, to study, uh, to make my executive, executive uh, MBA in Ashridge, London. Mm. So again, I was paid for and uh, um, on a good salary and, and got the time to do this uh, MBA in, in Ashridge. So, um, yeah, um, I think I was always working hard. Mm. So um, and my concept of luck is um, when opportunity uh, meets preparation. So I was always prepared to take on new challenges. Right. Uh, I, actually, I never stopped uh, uh, learning. Mm. And, and once I finished all my degrees, then I started teaching. So I, I did teach uh, at Mannheim uh, University, creativity and innovation, which for a business school at that point in time was something very new. Um, what I also um, uh, uh, teach, uh, the uh, taught um, informatics and finance at uh, Wiesbaden Business School. So mm. um, I always think it's once you have mastered something, it's good to teach, and also teaching help you helps you to think through things in great detail. Because one thing is uh, that you can do and perform the things by yourself. Uh, but the no moment you are forced uh, to design a curriculum and uh, to prepare all the papers, you, you, you again, deep think about things. Mm. Uh, and uh, I, I still think if you look at my presentation these days, uh, you, you can dig deeper and deeper and deeper and you always will, will get an answer because I really have thought about the things. That's exciting. Um, I, I got a chance to work for Pepsi when I graduated from university in a management training program and they paid for my MBA, which I did at nighttime for, for that. But uh, I was eternally grateful. Um, and the other thing about uh, teaching that's really, I, I, I would say it's my advice to anybody listening is if you get a chance to teach, do it because, you know, for, for me, I, I always was frustrated with teachers that would skip steps. So it's like they would explain something, but then I really couldn't figure out, you know, there was something missing. And I just now, as I grew older, I realized that those were probably not that great of teachers and they were kind of rushing through something or maybe they didn't understand enough to be able to stop and explain it. And what I've tried to do in my teaching is to try to take people step by step. And that requires a lot of work. You really have to put yourself in the shoes of the other person and, so I really appreciate you know what you say because I think 
if you do that and you put yourself in the shoes of your students, you're going to really have to think through things deeply. And then once you do that, though, you'll be an exceptional teacher because the students will feel like you carry them step by step through that learning process. So I admire that. So tell me about uh, some of your, you know, what, what does it take to succeed in the world of finance? And one of the interesting things about you is that you found your niche within a bigger organization. And it seems like you've stayed with that niche and grown with that niche. Whereas some people may, you know, go from one thing to another. It's just interesting to hear your story about what, why you stuck with that niche? What was the benefit of that? Or, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So uh, let's say once you have gone through the whole process, you always will find good explanations. <laughs> <laughs> Hindsight uh, is twenty yeah. twenty. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but, but so uh, you may laugh, but let's say in, that I go into banking has something to do with with, with Wall Street, the, the movie Wall Street. So I was really interested in the investment banking part of, of banking. And I I was very happy that, that at Deutsche Bank in, in the local branch of Mannheim, they had a department and that they were happy to uh, uh, to welcome me, which because it was a small department. So mm. uh, not many people had the opportunity and it was at, at the moment in time where electronic trading started. So the first futures and options um, uh, on an electronic, let's say, um, trading system. And that was exactly when I made this apprenticeship. And I thought, wait a minute, this computer thing seems to be something important. You need to think it was back in 1919. When, when I started, so 1990, right? So, mm. um, and, and therefore I thought, okay, um, if I think that through traders will be replaced by computers, a at least that was my belief right. uh, at that point in time. So I said, okay, then, then mm. I want to know more about these computers and I want to study it and I want, so, so I don't think that, that I'm one of the best people or most qualified, I'm, I'm surely not, or also not most intelligent, but, um, but I'm pretty work hard. And I always understood that um, in order to be successful, you need to find your niche. So, and for me, then the niche was always, at the beginning was the intersection of banking and technology. And, and the problem with technology is it innovates so fast, right? So over time, I realized just by my work that innovation uh, is important as well. Mm. And, and, um, and sometimes I had the opportunity to move, but, but I always thought, okay, don't measure yourself with the very best people. Uh, uh, it's, if you want to have um, a career, I think, first of all, you need to love what you do because otherwise it's just about the money. It's a job. That's the difference between having a job and a profession. Mm -hmm. So, so I have a profession, uh, and the job is something nine to five, or even if it's nine to nine, but it's still a job. That's a bad thing because you will spend most of your time in your life working. So I rather would recommend you do something which you love. Of course, it will not always be pleasant. It will not always be nice, but, but in principle, you should love it. And mm. then you, there are always good and bad times, uh, but the good times, if you love something, should be, our, let's say, the larger part. And, and, and therefore, this is um, how I found more or less by working the niche, but I also was always conscious about let's say uh, where I can compete against all the other people who are working. Mm. And uh, somehow I managed, let's say, to navigate 
uh, by the opportunities, but but always I I I focused on something which is on in the end on the intersection of of, of banking technology and uh, and innovation. And even in time when I at some point in time at Deutsche Bank I realized that will not help me going forward. At least not let's say within the next five years. And that was basically the moment after 21 years at Deutsche Bank, I left Deutsche Bank to do something on my own because to me it was clear that this kind of niche was not valued at that point in time. Mm. And I could not figure out if that could be valued the next five years. So uh, while I was at that time already teaching uh, innovation and innovation is about change and change usually or should start with yourself. Um, I moved on, mm. which was a huge step in my life to, to, because the only thing I did know was Deutsche Bank. And, um, it was also in a phase where I just built a house. So I was deep in debt. Mm. Uh, I was a single earner of a family of four. So it was also quite a risk at that point in time. Uh, okay. Uh, 10, basically 10 years later, because I left Deutsche Bank in 2010, I think was the right move at the right time because it was in the beginning where now disruption in banking actually happens. Mm. And of course, a lot of people are pretty interested in my experience, uh, which I made basically at least for the last 20 to 25 years where I was involved in many, many change, innovation and transformation programs in by now many financial institutions. Got it. And some young people are intimidated when they go to work in a company. They see lots of smart people and, you know, everybody's working hard. And it's hard to have a lot of confidence when you're a young person starting your career in finance. And um, I'm there's a couple of thoughts that I have and I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. But the, the first thought is I always tell people, you know, don't compare yourself to someone like, you know, you Frank or myself, because, you know, it's just impossible that someone brand new could have the experience that we have. And so therefore kind of compare yourself to your peers. And then if you think about differentiating yourself relative to your peers, I would say it's not really that hard. You don't have to be a genius you know, that it just takes some diligent effort to learn a little bit more deeply about the subject that you're interested in that area and that most people don't do that. But I'm curious about your experience about building your place in a big organization. And is that difficult? Is it overwhelming? Is it not that, you know, difficult? Or what are your thoughts on that? Um, I personally did not find it very difficult mm. because I looked what most people are not interested in. So I started in investment banking and I realized soon that most people are not interested in retail banking. And I thought, oh, that's great. Then look at retail banking. Um, and then I realized, oh, everybody wants to be in business development or M&A and things like that. And nobody cares about technology. What I thought given money spent at the bank mm. is second after uh, the spend for people that okay that should it must be important so so i moved into retail banking technology and then i realized nobody cares about the future <laughs> they, they don't look at what's happening in two or three or five years what's the latest technology how can you apply it what's the benefit of the technology how, what's the benefit for cloud computing for retail banking customers? Mm. Nobody did take the effort to think about it. And what I did, and, and I realized two things. First of all, it's not so difficult. And yeah. secondly, if you figure it out and tell other people, uh, some of them become very interested in, if you can tell them, look, we can save 80% of our costs. Therefore you can, uh, produce a, a better service or a cheaper service uh, to the customer and 
let's try it on a small scale. And the only thing you then need to figure out is you need to find a senior manager who, 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 who understands that and supports you in, in your journey. Um, but that's also the advantage of a large organization. There mm -hmm. are plenty of senior managers. Right. You just need to find one. And you always will find one. Because it's Particularly a if you're passionate and if you're passionate about, you know, that yeah. this can make an impact. Yeah. And, and I, I would say that was now my path. Um, but, but there are so many other topics like accounting. So, so, so areas where people usually don't like, there are very good areas to excel and, and make a difference. And of course, you need to think in the end, what kind of difference do you make to the real customer who pays your salary? Mm -hmm. Because in the end of the day, it's not the boss or your, or the company, it's the customer buying your services. If you can somehow relate your work to that outcome, uh, uh, this is, this is a very good, let's say, way to also prove what kind of value you, you contribute to the overall organization. So, and, and if you can that, if you are able to explain that, then you always will find somebody who will listen to you. And then of course you need proof that, that it, it's not just a thought, but it really works in, in the real world. And if mm. that works, then people will give you the next challenge and the next challenge and the next challenge. And then it depends on your, let's say, and your willingness, let's say, to uh, uh, to actually perform and 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 fulfill and succeed project by project. So mm. so also, I would recommend look it from that perspective. Let's say, uh, perform from day to day. So today is the most important day, and then tomorrow is the most important day tomorrow. <laughs> So don't think what's happening in five years because let's say, of course, you need to have an understanding of trends and, and, and the general direction, but ultimately what depends on people see is your performance at the moment in time. Yep. Okay. That's great. Um, one of the things that you're highlighting is kind of the, the blue ocean strategy concept of swimming out of a bloody ocean where everybody's competing and looking for a place where there's, there is potential demand. Obviously you don't want to go to a place where there just really is no interest, but go to a place where there's some demand, but there's nobody there and then create your niche. That's very, you know, clear. And I think great advice. Um, you know, the, the second thing is when a young person goes into a company, the only thing they think about is their boss. You know, it's like they got to, that boss gave them a job and they're going to, you know, maybe they think about their boss and their company, but very few young people go in and think about the customer that takes years. And so I think the lesson that I think that I learned from what you've said is from day one, think about the voice of the customer, think about the customer experience. And I think a lot of, a lot of internet type of companies that have come out these days are so customer centric and they're testing things with the customer that, it's definitely, there's a lot of opportunity for that, but I imagine majority of young people probably go into companies and they really ha have a hard time focusing on the customer because they probably don't see the customer that much and they see their boss and they see their company. So great advice. What else, what else yeah. would you, yep, go ahead. Uh, no, I, I would really agree that let's say the customer is the ultimate objective for any business, so mm. as you work in a business, you need to fully understand what your role is related to the customer or the customers uh, of, of your company. So that, um, of course, if you are in the internet business, um, that's what you learn first. But mm -hmm. also in the trading department, so I was also more in the sales department. It was, right. so we did not invent products or not a lot, but, but we did say sell products. So, right. so the customer were always number one in our thinking, how can we make processes easier? 
faster, cheaper. That, 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 that basically, that's still true as of today, where we talk about uh, user experience, uh, but, but still the formula is the same. We'll make it easier for the customer to use. Uh, that's basically what we do in financial services. Mm. And um, this is what will make um, uh, yourself and also the company successful if you get it right. And the good news is for young people who are looking at finance, uh, most traditional finance companies, they are still product focused from the technology point of view, from a process point of view, from a cultural point of view. So there is enough room for position yourself at something which is uh, uh, relevant. Uh, never said that it's easy. Actually, mm. it's hard, uh, but it's worth the effort. Got it. All right, I want to I want to wrap it up by maybe just a, a couple of other questions. The uh, the the next question I want to talk about is just the idea of how do you manage yourself personally in you know, through health and fitness and uh, nutrition, sleep, all those different things that sometimes when we're young, we put those things aside, but just curious about maybe something about the way you look at those things or routines that you do that, yeah, on that area. So how yeah, about that? Yeah, yeah. So um, when I was very young, I was an athlete doing decathlon. Mm. Uh, so sport is part of my my life um uh, also by now i have a young kid uh who is uh, maybe be will become a professional soccer player he's 16 so he's now exactly at the edge of whether he will be able to become a professional soccer player or not uh, mm. right now it looks good so we are very hard thinking about discipline routines and how to improve daily routines and so do i so even if i don't need to i wake up in the morning at 6 30 i uh, do the breakfast probably i have fruits i drink a lot of water i go onto my desk i structure my day that i have every morning seven days a week uh, in the morning i actually work I do my posts, I do review presentations, I do produce presentations, uh, all these things uh, until uh, we have lunch, which is usually at one, uh, often with the whole family. Mm. And then the afternoon may be more unstructured, depending on what, but, but let's say there are always four to five working hours in the morning. Um, and usually, the routine is in the afternoon or in the evening that uh, we do either together with my wife, I do walking or we go jogging or we go to the gym. Mm. And we do that, do that on average five times a week for uh, 60 to 90 minutes. So I, I would say I'm given my age, I'm pretty fit. Um, and I deeply believe that one thing comes with the other. So, so having the energy to study, to learn, to read, uh, uh, there is a relation to, let's say, your physical uh, health. Yep. Um, and, and one is supporting the, the other. Of course, I'm fortunate that I'm pretty healthy. Mm. So that not all people have this situation. Yep. Uh, but of, a, again, um, luck comes with preparation so not all the time you 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 are in the mood to go to the gym right yeah uh then i only do 60 percent of the weights which i usually do just mm. to keep the routine so also in the morning sometimes i just have no idea to write then then i may write just in half an hour and it's something which i cannot use and throw to the throw throw away again but but keeping the routines and keeping the discipline uh is to me uh, really important and that's also what i'm teaching my son mm. that that he has daily routines and, and then again it comes what i said earlier it's not about uh let's say what you achieve in three years 
No, it's about improving yourself every day by half or a quarter of a percent. Mm -hmm. So if in the evening you can say, okay, I have accomplished these five tasks and I've proved myself on one thing. For me, that's good enough. And, yeah. and that's achievable because if you do it 365 days, or let's say 300 days, because mm -hmm. taking 65 days off. So if you do that on 300 days a year, that where the big difference comes from. Got it. And, and Got if it. you do that for 10 years, that's where the huge difference comes. Mm -hmm. And, and um, this is how I look at it, uh, how to improve yourself. And you need these daily routines and processes where you don't have to think about, you just do it. Yeah. I think that's, uh, that's very helpful. You know, I, we have a lot in common. I, I just happened to, since I don't have a family yet, I'm still young, you know, uh, but we'll, I will get one one day, but while I'm still young, I, I tend to wake up much earlier than that and go exercise and do all that. But, uh, but I think that one of the things that I've always felt like is that I try to do the hardest things in the morning because by the time it gets to the afternoon, it's just hard to get my mind to focus on it. And so I try to arrange all my meetings and calls and other things like that in the afternoons because that I'm more suited for that. But if it's cracking something that I've got to really break through writing something, I really need to do it in the morning. And I, I pretty much do it seven days a week. And I try to tell people that um, really you probably only have four hours of real concentrated time that you could do where you're really thinking hard and working hard on something. And if that's the case, what I've done is try to capture that early in the morning before people take it away from me. So I like what you said about routines and, and, and how you do that. It's, uh, it's powerful. And for a young person that's not yet really seen the benefit of putting those routines into action, this will be, you know, what you're, what you're saying is going to be very valuable. What, uh, in, what would be your parting words of advice for a young person starting to build their career in finance? So I, I would, really advise that look at something and do something you're really passionate about it and uh, focus not only on what's your day job let's say start to producing content by yourself write a blog or organize, uh, let's say, a series of meetings or something like that mm. uh, on top of it. Uh, and all, also, let's say, exercise your writing and speaking skills uh, to a broader audience. And, and, and in the current age, start building your followers. And, and and the whole thing starts with your first follower. <laughs> hmm. So don't think about 10,000 followers. Think about the first one. <laughs> right, right. And, and then get that first one. And after the first one, get the second one. And after the second one, get the third one. And, and, and then do that day by day. If you win at the beginning one a day, that's good enough. At some point in time, if you do it for 10 years, you will they win 100 a day. So that's my concept of living. Uh, let's say the next is always the most important uh, and do it and think about the very small steps and time will prove you right or wrong mm. and maybe once a year do you rethink all the things you have done or twice a year and then you adjust uh, don't turn everything around look what to keep and what to let go and and that that's i think that that's what helped me a lot and that's what i say usually to young people who ask me fantastic i i want to thank you for sharing you know so much of your story and there's so much that um that we can take away from this um whether it's routines whether it's about health whether it's about building your little niche and building strength in that whether you know, the last things you've just said about starting with that audience of one and then two and then three. 
don't put so much pressure on yourself, figure out how, and it go, again, that goes back to the other thing that I gained from you, which is the voice of the customer. And if you focus in on that one or two followers, and then it goes to four, and then it goes to eight, but you understand them well and you help them, you know, then you really created something. So I want to thank you very much for sharing. Oh, thank you for giving the platform and um, all the best to you and uh, speakers. See you uh, in the future. Yeah.